The EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network presents Getting God's Help with Father Benedict Rochelle. Now, Father Rochelle. Hello, I'm Father Benedict Rochelle of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal from the South Bronx. And this is the fifth segment in our 10-part series on the gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts that answer the question, how do I get God's help in my life? I'm not broadcasting from the South Bronx. You may wonder where this room is that we're broadcasting in. And this is the retreat room of the Trinity Retreat in Larchmont, New York, where I've worked for 30 years. The rest of our brothers and sisters all live in the South Bronx or in Harlem or in Newark or in other uh, poor places where I got stuck here in Larchmont 30 years ago as the janitor, and I'm still here. But that's how it works. When you trust God, you don't know where he's going to put you. Thank God I'm able to commute when I'm better down to the Bronx and Harlem to work with our beloved poor people. Now today's conference is on the gift of counsel. And there's a whole lot here. Right off the bat, counsel is a gift of God which comes to a person when they have to make difficult decisions or help others make difficult decisions. And it's kind of an intuition. It sort of comes to them. Now this doesn't mean that there isn't counsel that you arrive at using your intelligence and even learning. I happen to have a degree in counseling psychology. I studied counseling psychology for 11 years, part-time. And I've used what I learned at Columbia and at Iona, and uh, I'm grateful to have had that training. But I learned early on to make room for the intuition or the gift of counseling, especially when there were things in front of me that I didn't know what to do about, and in front of people who came to me for counseling, and they didn't know what to do. And this is where the gift of counsel works. And when that gift is ignored, or is not even known about, counseling and psychotherapy can get into big trouble. Now those could be fighting words. Only recently, the annual convention, 19, 2004, of the American Psychological Association, there was almost a riot, I am told. There's profound disagreements in this field over what should be done, what counseling particularly on what therapy means. I don't have a chance to go into it all, but I should say that the approach to therapy and counseling that I was taught in my studies, which began 40 years ago, has completely and absolutely changed into something shorter, more dependent on medication, more dependent on very highly defined ideas. And the notion of going for therapy twice a week for five years and kind of rambling around is no longer a popular idea. I'm not saying that it didn't do some good. My impression is that all of therapy could have done much more good if there was some recognition and room for the fact that we needed God to guide us. I had an ex interesting experience. I had always gone to Catholic school all my life, except once I went to public school when I lived in the country. And so when I left the seminary, I left Catholic college where I got my master's degree, I went to Columbia. And I was a little bit apprehensive 
this is not a religious school, and uh, I sort of look like a religious person, you know. So I mean, you could kind of tell. And I thought, well, maybe they're going to give me a hard time. I got no hard time at all. I had a wonderful five years, and I spent a fair amount of time speaking about spiritual and religious things, not so much to the students, but to the professors. And they would draw me into conversation, long conversation, read books, because they themselves had a feeling that somehow or other we were missing an element of human life. And I have to say, these were people often who did not belong to any religion. They did not have great value on the virtue of humility. But they showed real humility in admitting that something was missing. And that something was missing became quite apparent some years later. In those years, we were very much influenced by the thinking of Sigmund Freud, who had developed what he called the talking therapy, a psychoanalysis. Uh, he changed the name later on. And Jung, Adler, Horney, Sullivan, Rogers particularly, was very influential. Rogers just got you to talk and kept you talking. And you got better, according to the theory. All of a sudden, about 1990, the famous old therapists who had started at the end of the Second World War were all retiring. And there was a big question. Did we do anything? Did we help anybody? They asked the question. I didn't ask it. But the answer is in the question. If you have to ask the question, did we help anybody, then it's not too obvious that you did. Now, I think they did help people, but I do think they could have helped people a lot more if we had been open to the Holy Spirit, at least the Holy Spirit as he worked in the client, but the Holy Spirit as he worked in the therapist. Now, I'm not saying that there weren't therapists who relied on the gift of counsel. There were, and uh, many clergymen, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, studied counseling, and some of them brought a sense of the Spirit of God to what they were doing. Unfortunately, some did not. Some got completely intrigued by the idea of counseling under religious auspices. I remember going to a dialogue of people who were trying to decide what pastoral counseling was, as counseling by a pastor, someone affiliated with the church. And the clearest thing they could come up with is that pastoral counseling was counseling done on property that was tax exempt for religious purposes. That's awful. That's simply awful. It misses the entire spiritual component of a human being. And some of the greatest of the popular psychologists at that time did not miss the spiritual component. I don't want to get a lot of letters from therapists that are mad at me, so I won't use too many names. But there were people like Father Adrian Van Kam, who was a great priest psychologist, uh, and, and there were a number of others who wrote, laymen like Dr. Mark Stern, and they wrote about human beings who had a spiritual component. Some of the big names, uh, Karen Horney, these are names you might recognize. And the famous Carl Jung was always kind of walking around the edges of it all. Although I have a quotation from Jung that most people have never seen, but I got it in a letter, uh, in a quotation from an English book, that Jung, when he was 
very old said, and this is a very interesting quotation, it goes to the effect, if I had not been given the grace to know the dogma that religious teaching is true, I would have died hating religion and hating the church. But as it is, I have come to know that it is true. That's in a book by F.C. Happold. Now, let's get back to us. You've got a big problem in life, and what do you do? Well, one of the most intelligent things to do, if you've got a big problem and you don't know how to solve it, is ask somebody whose intelligence and at least attempts at wisdom you respect and listen to them. But these people must be people who are open to the voice of God, open to the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you're going to be working at cross purposes with life. The Holy Spirit is everywhere in the world, completely everywhere. He has been sent to us by Christ. Christ says this, when I go, I will send you the Holy Spirit, says this in John 14. And so it's very important to be aware of the Spirit and that he can guide us. Even speaking about one of the most difficult moments in life, our Savior gives this word. He's talking to the apostles and warning them that they're going to be persecuted. And he says, Beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils. They will flog you in their meetings. You will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and before the Gentiles. And when they deliver you up, don't be anxious about what you are to say or how you are to speak. For what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Now this is a very, very difficult moment. You may never be in that moment of persecution. I hope you're not. But it may be a very serious and painful moment of the death of someone near to you or their terminal illness or a failure of some enterprise or the failure of someone that you trusted in. And then you may need counseling. You may, may, may need help. Or you just may be at a point where you don't know what to do. You're dissatisfied with life, with how it's going. Go get someone who will help you but is open to the gift of counsel and has a respect for the things of God. People often said to me, can you recommend a good Catholic psychologist? I said, well, it depends on where the emphasis is in the sentence, good or Catholic. I could send you to a psychologist who's a Catholic, but he's not a very good Catholic. Or he's a Catholic, but he's not a very good psychologist. I would rather send somebody for counsel to someone who has a profound respect for God and religion. I know a Jewish psychiatrist who all his life helped Catholic priests. And he helped them because he had a very real respect for our vocation, for the uniqueness about our vocation, especially celibacy. If he didn't have that respect, I'd be aware of him. I'd be a little bit wary of him because you have to have a respect for the person that you're trying to counsel. It's a good work, one of the works of mercy, to counsel the doubtful. That's listed among the works of mercy. But it's like cooking for the poor. Before you decide to cook for the poor, please do me a favor and learn how to cook. I've been working with the poor all my life, and every once in a while you get something for the poor by somebody who doesn't know how to cook. Learn how to cook. Give them the best. 
And that is true of counseling and even of therapy. There are ways to study these things that are profoundly reverent and religious. I have to tell you that my experience studying for a doctorate in psychology from a secular university was a religious experience for me. And it was a religious experience for many people around me because they came and spoke to me about faith and religion, about their doubts, about their needs, about their fears. When I first arrived at Columbia, I said, you know, they're going to be nothing religious about this place. And I found out that one of the professors who taught statistics, Dr. Goldberg, was a Hasidic Jew. And he had a picture of the Lubavitcher Rebbe on the wall of his office. And when he taught, he taught like somebody out of the Fiddler on the Roof. He had the big tables and magnificent uh, all kinds of pictures and drawings and symbols all over the place. It was, it was a poetic experience. And that makes mathematics a lot more tolerable if you're somebody like me who gets frightened when he sees all those mathematical signs. Look around in your own life. There are people who need counseling. And there are people who won't accept it. But someday they will accept it. Someday they'll fall flat on their face, and you should be there to come up and say, you know, I wanted to talk to you years ago because I could hear, see you heading for a brick wall. And now that you've hit it, would you like to talk? You may not be trained in counseling, but everybody can listen. And it's wise to be able to know someone who you trust, who is a person of faith, who sees the beauty of the human soul, the richness of a human being, is aware that human life is sacred, and then to send them to that person. This word sacred is a very important word in human life. Believe me, if you've got a son or daughter getting to be of marriageable age, you want them to marry someone who will see their life as sacred, who will see the pledge of matrimony as sacred, as something holy, who will see children from the moment of their conception as something sacred. In the United States and in Europe, a sense of the sacred is very much missing. And, and it's quite sad, quite sad. I've seen that, be, that sense of the sacred lost over the decades of my own life. It was tragic to see the European Union begin its history with an ignoring of the immense contribution that Christianity played in the establishment and the life of Europe. It was a denial of the sense of the sacred. If you walk around the United Nations building, which is a place that has its troubles, believe me, when they built it 50 years ago, there was a sense of the sacred. There were all sorts of sacred objects in the United Nations building. Most people don't know it. There's a stained glass window with scenes from the Old and New Testament including the crucifixion and resurrection. It's a beautiful stained glass of St. Francis. There are crosses, ancient crosses from Armenia. There are several statues illustrating verses from the Bible. And there's a wonderful, huge outdoor statue of St. George killing the dragon. And the dragon is a two-headed monster with intercontinental ballistic missiles as its two heads. And that, that statue, the triumph of good over evil, was given to the United Nations by Michael Gorbachev in his last year as president of the Soviet Union. It's a sacred statue. There was a sense of the sacred. Now, somehow or other, in the media, 
The sacred is mocked in films in every way possible. I said to a friend of mine, Jewish friend of mine who's an attorney, why are they always against the Catholic Church? Why do they mock the Catholic clergy incessantly? And he says, it's easy. You are the biggest. And they really want to hit all religion. But if they hit you, if they knock you out, the Catholics, then they will have gotten it all. Oh, this is very scary. This is very, very scary. It's not scary for religion. People have been trying to kill off religion for millennia. It's not scary for the Catholic Church. We've buried many of our enemies, buried them nicely. Sometimes they came back before they died, but we were there at the funeral. But it's scary for societies and cultures that live without a sense of the sacred that are without counsel, without knowledge of self, without knowledge of the sacredness of human life. On the back of my little van, I have a sign. Life is sacred. Life is beautiful. And somehow or other, people miss this. Unfortunately, they miss it when they need it. And later on, they come to see you. And they're very sad because they went on without counsel, without the Holy Spirit. The woman who was involved in the case called Roe versus Wade. I was walking, I hope she doesn't mind me saying this. She's a very devout person right now. And has openly said how badly she was abused in that case by those who wanted to manipulate it. And I was walking through the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception. And I saw this woman praying very devoutly and sadly. And I said to Father Pavone, the pr a priest for life, I said, Frank, who is that woman? He says, don't you know who that is? That's Roe of Roe versus Wade. My goodness. She looks like a spirit-filled woman. But you see, years before, without relying on the spirit, she had been abused and misused in order to promote abortion. If there's anything that the United States of America and its civil leaders need, it's the gifts of the Holy Spirit. If there's anything that the leaders of religion need in the United States is the gifts of the Holy Spirit, especially the gifts of courage and counsel. As our country goes down the drain into paganism, I have to say that I'm disappointed that the voice of religion is not so loudly raised. We're moving in the same direction of the countries of Europe, which have lost their soul. If the United States loses its soul, I assure you, it's over. It was Benjamin Franklin who said that this country could only survive with religious people. And it's a shame to see it perish because God is here, but he's being ignored. In your life, ask yourself the question, do I ask God to lead me? Do I ask the counsel of those who try to do the work of God and think seriously about the work of God? Christian psychology, Christian counseling, any truly religious counseling is not only going to try to find out what a person really wants, it's going to try to find out what God really wants. There are two people involved in any important decision of life. You, I, and God. And when we leave God out, we become quickly, rapidly, more and more disappointed and sophisticated 
chimpanzees. That's what a human being is without a soul and without God. He's a chimpanzee. And I have to apologize to chimpanzees because they're being what they're supposed to be. They're being animals. But we are not simply animals. It was one of the mistakes of many psychiatrists and psychologists, many of the founders, and it's now becoming a mistake of a great many other people. Human beings have an immortal fire burning within them, and that fire seeks to return to its origin, to the divine life of God. And no action is truly wise or helpful that ignores that fact. You've been listening to Getting God's Help with Father Benedict Groeschel. Join us again next time on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Join us for the Daily Mass, celebrated each day here on EWTN.